Um, actually, I want to start by um, obviously thanking the department for the invitation. I remember sitting out there as an MA student and thinking it would be nice to one day be able to give one of these talks. So I hope this is uh, interesting and useful to you guys. Um, so in the present moment, uh, globally, of shifting identities and heightened sensitivities towards otherness and belonging. Many communities across the world, with their own indigenous cultures and languages, are rediscovering, reinventing, and reasserting the value and importance of their autochthonous cultural practices. And some of those communities are doing so in the midst of the bubbling anxieties of Brexit Britain. Of the, th of the approximate 3,000 endangered languages in the world, over 100 are native to Europe, and a handful have evolved on what is now British soil, namely Manx, Cornish, Jernersie in Guernsey, and Gerie in Jersey, not to mention the other less endangered native languages of Britain, including Welsh and Scottish Gaelic, as well as British Sign Language. <coughs> Whilst many activists and researchers are working towards language safeguarding and revitalisation, few studies have looked in depth at the role of music in this process. My research investigates the ways in which applied ethnomusicological research is helping to shape language beliefs re uh, and reconstruct cultural identity and revitalise the critically endangered language of Jerie in Jersey, where I was born and raised. But before we get into that, I'm going to ease you in with a video that was made uh, as a teaching resource as one of my applied projects. It explains quite a bit about the context of my work and introduces one of the projects. I figured what better way to start a presentation on a Tuesday afternoon than with a little bit of children's television. Hello, my friends. I'm Agent Kimmington of the Special Toad Service. But now, my friends, now we face a mission that may well be beyond us, unless you all get on board and join us in the quest. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to save Jerrye! Now, Jerrye, in case you don't know, is Jersey's own special ancient language, spoken here for hundreds of years. Just like the Jersey Toad, it is unique to our little island. Over a thousand years ago, when the Vikings invaded the north of France, they brought their ancient Norse language. And mixed it with the local version of Latin, which had arrived hundreds of years before with the Romans. Quo igitur patientius perseverabimus, eo maiore ribitoria. The languages combined, and in time, Gerie evolved from there. It's older than English and French, and we've got hundreds of stories and poems and songs in Gerie that are unique to our little island. But if no one knows how to speak the language, they will be lost forever. forever. There we are, pause it there. That's enough for now. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube later if you like. Um, I'm going to see you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to watch the whole thing. So as you saw in the video, Gerie is a distinct dialect of Norman, unique to Jersey, having evolved there since roughly 900 AD. It's a Latin-based Romance language influenced by Norse with traces of Celtic, Germanic and latterly French and English. Jersey today is an urbanised, high-tech, offshore finance centre, yet with, this, uh, with its own ancient island culture and heritage, natural beauty and ecological assets. The island is nine miles by five in size, with a population of about 100,000. It sits only 15 miles from the French coast, yet is politically British due to a simple quirk of history. The decision of one Norman knight, Pierre de Préau, that settled Jersey's destiny by pledging his allegiance as Lord of the Channel Islands to King John of England after the rest of Normandy had fallen to King Philip II of France in 1204. Now, as culture shifts in the 21st century, Jersey faces its own questions of identity. 
particularly in terms of the highly symbolic and profound issue of language identity and use. <coughs> Gerier was once commonly spoken across the island, with most residents being trilingual with English and French, but its use has declined over the past two centuries under increased Anglicisation. A colonial mindset disparaged Gerier as a useless peasant's language, <coughs> presenting the king's English as superior. Gerier is now severely endangered, with only a few hundred fluent speakers remaining, almost all over the age of 65. Nowadays, less than 3% of the population claim any working knowledge of it. But despite all this, Gerier has survived. And in recent years, uh, we've seen the beginnings of revitalization, thanks to a few key activists and organizations. And music has been an active part of the strategy. Uh, since uh, 2012, when I was commissioned by the uh, local government department for Gerier to arrange and record six Gerier songs in a more current style for teachers to use as a resource, music's been a specific active part of their, the school teaching work. And the band, Badlebeck, emerged from this commission, uh, subsequently became a feature of my MA research leading to my doctoral study. My methodology can be broadly characterised as mixed methods autoethnographic research, taking an applied ethnomusicological approach. So, um, oh, let's skip to this slide already. <coughs> Um, so, just a bit on applied ethnomusicology, if you're, if you're not that familiar, just this, this one um, quite key quote, um, so I'll read it out for you. So, eth applied ethnomusicology is an approach to ethnomusicology that is guided by principles of social responsibility, which extends the usual academic goal of broadening and deepening knowledge and understanding towards solving concrete problems and toward working both inside and beyond typical academic contexts. And just a little bit on autoethnography. Um, so, it uses a researcher's personal experience to describe and critique cultural beliefs, practices and experiences, acknowledges uh, and values a researcher's relationships with others, uses deep and careful self-reflection, typically referred to as reflexivity, to name and interrogate the intersections between self and society, the particular and the general, the personal and the political. It shows people in the process of figuring out what to do, how to live, and the meaning of their struggles. It balances intellectual and method methodological rigour, emotion and creativity, and it strives for social justice to make life better. So that's my aim in my autoethnography. So um, <coughs> my field works consisted of three main applied projects. Um, so an album released by Badlebeck, in November 2017, and I'll play you a clip from that in a bit. Uh, a community-based collaborative songwriting project, again, we'll come to a little clip from that. And a primary school singing project, which the previous clip, you might guess, uh, related to. That was part of the teaching resource for that. Um, and uh, here, here they are. So um, the primary school project involved teaching the song Mon Biopti Jerry, or Beautiful Jersey, to 280 children from 10 different classes across six schools. A choir of about 30 volunteers was then formed to perform the song on Liberation Day, <coughs> which is the annual celebration of Jersey's liberation from Nazi occupation in 1945. And here they are, don't they look adorable? Um, so, uh, Badlebeck, that's uh, my little band. So as mentioned, Badlebeck is an amateur pop folk band that grew out of the original commission to re-record songs in 2012. <coughs> The band is now well established in the local cultural landscape, performing regularly at festivals and cultural events, releasing recordings and appearing in the local press, raising the profile of the language and helping shape its public image as, as a living part of local cultural identity. Badlebeck's repertoire mixes recontextualized traditional songs, translated pop covers and original songs, arranged in an eclectic style that draws on pop and folk influences from around the world, according to our website. So I'll play you a little clip from this. Yeah, even create 
coco, coco la chair Décroche la lame et trilagne Coco, coco la chair Um, right. You can watch the epic video in its entirety later <coughs> at your leisure. I'll quickly run through some <laughs> of the foundational concepts behind my research. So firstly, uh, culture uh, and understanding of it as a system of shared beliefs, values, customs, etc. That is not a fixed entity, but unbounded, contested, negotiated and historically produced. Indeed, every language and for that matter music is subject to the same cultural evolution fought out in everyday life where relations of power are exercised. And similarly, identities are always evolving and constructed through time. Um, so I'm broadly making use of a constructivist or non-essentialist conception of identity as a process rather than a fixed or unified thing. Some references there, Stuart Hall, Judith Butler, psychology, a whole range of literature on that. Um, from sociolinguistics, um, successful language revitalization movements require deliberate and careful policy and planning. A key factor in this is something sociolinguists call status planning, which deals with aspects of language planning that reflect, reflect primarily social issues. So the likelihood of uh, successful language revitalization rests largely upon the attitudes, motivations, beliefs and ideologies concerning language that are the <coughs> most prevalent in the community. So the crucial question of why bother saving the language is profoundly dependent upon the way that the language is linked to a collective sense of cultural identity. And music, of course, is a unique mode of public engagement and a powerful medium of identity construction. So a little bit which uh, should be familiar to most of you, no doubt, um, on music and identity, um, which is obviously key. Uh, so many scholars have written about music and identity. Some uh, of the most well-known examples being Simon Frith, Martin Stokes, Tia Denora, and David Hesmanhausch. I think that's how to pronounce it. Um, so I'll just read this quote uh, for you. Music constructs our sense of identity through the direct experience it offers the body, time, and sociability, experiences which enable us to place ourselves in imaginative cultural narratives. Okay. Um, Yeah, so for good or for ill, musical sounds can communicate, mobilise and organise identities in context. The main aim of my research in Jersey is to explore new ways to use an applied methodology to help the community shift and develop its language beliefs and foster a genuine grassroots identification with Gerrier that embraces the language in a lasting way. My three projects engage with the public and in different ways, giving me a range of experiences and perspectives to enrich my ethnographic description and understanding. So I'll just play you a short clip from the Jersey Song Project, which involved organising and curating collaborative songwriting between Gerrier speakers and 12 different local bands and singers, culminating in a final performance in a professional venue as part of a local festival. So this clip shows a local pop rock band called Midriff working with Gerrier author Joan Tapley. So if you've got one too many... One too many, yeah. Oshta. Can we just get rid of the Oshta? Oh, well... I had so many days. Now, stuck with you. Osha, yeah, I mean, I, you don't have to say yeah, I. Yeah, you like Plaza. Now, stuck with you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I'll conclude by referring to the pithy phrase of my title, Jersey by birth, French by nature, British by mistake. I first heard this phrase from the drummer in Badlebeck, Johnny Pierce, 
who told me that he got it from some old boy back in the day, perhaps even 20 or 30 years ago. Whilst it isn't a common phrase in Jersey, it is familiar to some of the older folks I've spoken to and captures not just the arbitrary nature of that fateful decision by Pierre de Préau in 1204, but something of the ambivalence towards the imposition of an ideological form of Britishness and Anglicisation that has crept or occasionally leapt upon the island's culture over the past 200 years, and in particular since Churchill's Tommies marched up from the harbour in 1945. There is no space here to explore all the various reasons and power dynamics behind the cultural changes, but the past century has seen a trilingual community become an essentially monolingual one, on the cusp of losing its opportunity to turn that around. So Jersey now faces a reckoning with its identity, grappling with the choice between the often arduous, complex and Sisyphean task of reviving and maintaining its own cultural distinctiveness, and the much easier slide towards being more like a kind of generic satellite town of the south of England. Music offers a unique realm of interaction through which the communal negotiation of identity and language beliefs can occur. And whilst it's too early for me to draw any major conclusions from the data, it seems clear that my three successful fieldwork projects have generated a significant amount of encouraging ethnographic material in support of my thesis that applied ethnomusicological interventions can be an integral part of language revitalisation strategies and they offer a significant potential to contribute towards language revitalisation in a credible and lasting way. So all that remains for me to say is merci van der Fee. <laughs> there was a lot of work done in the especially in the 1970s in the regions of France to incorporate local uh, folk music into pop and rock mm -hmm. as part of the kind of push for regional mm -hmm. identity. Now, I mean, that's, that was much more in Britain than in Normandy, mm -hmm. he's not a million miles away. So, have you? dealt with those kinds of traditional tunes and the instrumentation at all? Interestingly enough, I've just come back from a, the launch of a new initiative by the, the, the Norman government, Normandy, which has now been unified. It used to be two regions, but now it's one region. And they've just launched with their um, latest president and you know, this big PR thing to, uh, to not only try and revitalise language, but look at Norman culture and try and rebrand Norman identity. Um, However, there isn't that much, from what I can tell, of a specific Norman music tradition, particularly when compared to Brittany, for example, with the bagpipes and all that. Um, so what's, what has tended to happen from, from what I've seen is a lot of songs, regional songs, come across and, and move around and indeed get translated into different languages, be they um, Norman or the kind of dialect of Norman Jerry, or in the case of Jersey, uh, English songs and coming back and forth, you know, into those dialects, but also French songs coming in. So it, it's more of a kind of folky mishmash as things just getting moved around that's quite hard to pin down rather than a tradition. Um, so, nevertheless, um, Badlebeck does play a few old songs which, you know, have been around and are therefore of, in some sense traditional to, um, to the region, even if the, we can show that they probably originated in Paris or something. We've, got, we've had our own version for how, so long that it's become quite identified locally. Um, so we do connect <coughs> with that as a band and obviously with our kind of recontextualised style. Um, it's you know we do our own twist on it but yeah so it's an interesting question as to whether how in terms of the language how useful it is to tap into that or how important it is to tap into that being that it's not so much of a uh, well-defined uh, musical identity so but it's, it is an interesting one for sure and there is a new book actually that's come out um so university of Caen, who were part of this recent initiative um they, they're also connected to an organisation, organisation called La Lour, who look after mainly they're trying to catalogue Norman songs and whatnot. And they put out a book recently called the the uh, the Songs of the Channel Islands or whatever. And what's interesting about it is it, it's you know, they've sort of catalogued these old recordings, Peter Kennedy and people that went out in the fifties and sixties and and tried to you know and made this kind of document of songs from the area. When you look at them, you know sort of mostly songs from elsewhere that have become our own local version. So 
in in a sense it isn't really a tradition it's just in a way the tradition is we've nicked stuff from elsewhere <laughs> so but yeah you know uh, and not particularly done anything unique to it other than put it in our dialect. Is there any sense of like regional identity? We, we always talk about relationships between the Channel Islands and, and, and Britain, uh, mm. mainland and the mainland Britain. But is there, is there a sense of a kind of regional cultural um, um, uh, specificity or, or kind of, you know, flavour between Brittany and the Channel Islands and Normandy? Is there a sort of shared... Um, well, I think Brittany's got and had for a longer time a much stronger political process to, you know, to think about their own and defend their own identity. Nor Normandy's not not been so militant about it, um, and so Jersey, being British but close to both those regions, is is, is in a sort of has been on this strange journey itself. Um, and used to have a lot of, of folks from Brittany. I mean, my grand was her parents from Brittany. Um, uh, but its its actual culture was Norman in that sense. So there was that those flavours from each. But in terms of the speci speci specificity of it, um, yeah, I mean, it's... it's it, I, I'm trying to think of the, the sort of markers of identity that are particularly Norman or... or, or <coughs> Of, yeah, or from Brittany that that, uh, that stand out. I mean, the the kinds of things that happen in um, uh, the sort of heritage moments or festivals that go on are things like cider drinking. So, cider is a marker, and it's sort of things related to that. There's a kind of um, butter. As they call it black butter. It's, it's not butter at all. It's a kind of spread made from apples. That gets made as traditional. That's as, you know that's sort of one fairly specific thing. That that there is a Norman version of that called sirop, which is effectively the same thing but without spices. Um, so there are a few of those things. Tradition. The traditions are you know, very rural, and if you're on the coast, fishing. Um, but then really, yeah, you're looking at the language and the literature that that exists. So outside of music, there is there is um, a long, a much wider, bigger, more specific tradition to Jersey of writing poetry, stories, um, sort of li real linguistic stuff that, that we, as a band, we've been able to draw on, which is really nice. We've been able to set some poems to music, like, you know, in a sort of folky-ish way. Um, but, like I say, yeah, there isn't, there isn't that much musically that stands out, Not certainly not like a sort of gypsy jazz type tradition. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of other, other markers of identity. <coughs> Yeah. What percentage of the population speak the language? Uh, so in Jersey, it's very, very tiny, really. Um, like I say, it's about three percent or so that that have responded to say they speak some on the on a previous census. census. The figures are a bit contested, particularly when it comes to the fluent or native speakers, because it's quite hard to track down everyone, you know, they're so old now and what level are they really using it? They don't get out much, so they, they talk to their cat maybe in Jerry, but you know <laughs> you know, so they do they do have gatherings. There's like what has been really good the last couple of years is these um, cafe meetings, a sort of open meeting, there's one in a pub and two in two in a cafe. Uh, that go on every week. So if you're sprightly enough to get out to them, you know, then great. But but you know I've been had it, you know sort of hooked up with a an old Jerry speaker a little while back who's like 92 you know and um, you know it's great to chat to him but he's not going to be going along to these events that regularly so yeah but the occupation is another one in terms of the Jersey identity and, and the kind of the way I mean, that's a whole thing I'm trying to write about now is the way that's impacted Jersey identity and how certain forces might have taken <coughs> hold of that and Create, used it as it were to their own ends in terms of the the Britishness and this, this sort of vision of Britishness, which yeah I find a bit problematic actually. But yeah, so it's an interesting journey for sure. And trying to think about how music connects to it, not just in the traditional sense, but moving forwards, what were these young bands might think of it, and whether they might build that into their ongoing set lists or whatever will be really interesting to see. There's one 
at the school project which has come totally kind of I haven't pushed for it at all it just come came to me whereby there's this, a 300 strong choir drawn from all the uh, state schools that are performing in June and they want to do one song in Jerio which is really interesting so they and they approached me on that so that yeah there's definitely some something going on that's interesting um, it's a case of trying to grapple with it and work out what 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 we can learn from it um, <laughs> in terms of ethnomusicology, but also in terms of sociolinguistics and see where it may go. Um, yeah. You're just a problem, though. You said there's something going on. How mm. much do you think that your greater engagement over the past few years has, in a way, facilitated that? Or do you think it's more to do with the general state of the situation? Yeah. In Jersey? Because I know there's yeah. obviously lots of going on, but... Yeah, bit, yeah, like, yeah. No, it's a key question, and you know that's the cr- the crux of you know how can I prove that what I've done is done has achieved X Y Z, um, and that that is a real challenge. I mean, it, that's why really I'm using I'm trying to use this quite close ethnography to sort of show the the, cl- the sort of as it were much more day to day moment to moment <coughs> impact of what I'm doing with the specific children I'm working with or with you know at certain gigs or whatever it might be. Um, but you know there are examples of, of people saying things to me. You know in terms of what you know what I represent or what I've done as a as a now a kind of public figure of sorts locally. Um, you know, for example, in in the in the Geria community, one um, the chairman of one of the Geria organisations. You know, it was sort of it's quite. A, uh, an interesting moment to deal with it myself. But it was like, oh, you, you are the gateway. You're the gateway to the next generation. You know, <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. You know, I don't. I definitely don't want to. I'm not the savior of the language, but I've definitely. It seems that people have responded to what I'm doing in, in a really positive way, and, and that it's having an impact. And another a comment from a Jerry teacher that um, there's been a renewed funding of the of the Jerry teachers in the school. Some new teachers coming through. Um, and um, you know, it, things are like I say, things are moving and growing. And he said to me something like, "I don't think things." I, I've quoted it somewhere. I don't think uh, things would be happening the same way in the same way as they are if it weren't for Badlebeck. So that's a, you know, <coughs> again, it's like you've got to put these quotes in context and know, try and work out are they to what extent are they just saying what I think, you know, what they think I want to hear, but. Yeah, there's but a lot of positive. Huge, though, you know, like, say, with Festival on to Teletique in Lorient, there's so much department funding into that. Uh-huh. In terms of, and then hundreds of thousands of people go over here. Right. So it's like, yeah, if you have that centralised funding, then mm. more things will happen. Yeah, so yeah, that's the key moment. what happens in Normandy, so I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Together. Yeah, exactly. It will be interesting, and, and yeah, it remains to be seen. It's literally like two weeks ago been launched. So, yeah, it could. It, it sounds great, you know, and it's definitely got all the kind of political energy. What will happen specifically? <laughs> I don't. I can't say for sure. Um, there, there is always the danger that these things are sort of identity politics and play into certain hands and ticking boxes. Um, so, but it could be great. So yeah, we'll we'll see.